All right, greetings, friends and comrades. Daniel Tut here with Carlos Garrido of Midwest Remarks Institute. Carlos is an American Cuban born or uh, Cuban heritage uh, philosopher. Carlos has been somebody I've been um, following and reading for a while now. Uh, his his organization has, in the American left, actually created quite an impressive following on social media, on TikTok, on YouTube. And they are communists. They are uh, very, very interesting um, Midwest remarks. They have a journal of American socialism, which Carlos can tell you about. Um, this is an effort which is certainly avoiding what the kind of um, American Communist Party is uh, often doing regarding the Democrats. Um, you guys have a strident critique of the Democrats. Um, and so uh, this conversation, Carlos, is really just to sort of get to know you a bit better. I think we both share a lot of political and philosophical points of interest. Um, I know you were reading my Nietzsche book. Um, I was, I finished the purity fetish. So I want to talk about purity fetish, maybe to kick it off. Uh, this is a book that Carlos is most well known for. And, um, could you, could you tell us, um, and then maybe we'll build into a little, hear a little bit more about Midwestern Marx, but let's kick it off with, um, your notion of purity fetish. I think it's a, a very interesting concept. Would you just give us the sort of, um, the meat? of the idea well first thank you so much for for having me on daniel i'm a great fan of your work and your program and i've been recommending how to read like a parasite to everyone who brings up nietzsche in any uh, discussion that alongside the sordos aristocratic rebels um so the purity fetish is a way of conceptualizing um in a positive form the absence of dialectical thinking uh, which i think pervades uh, Western Marxism, and uh, it doesn't just start, in my view, with what we uh, trace back to be Western Marxism. I think it goes much further back. And if you look at the letters on historical materialism in the 1890s, Engels is very clearly uh, dealing with um, the question of challenging the people that are going around calling themselves Marxists, but that in terms of their worldview, they're deeply anti-dialectical, they're very reductive for, for, for some things. I know that might scare people in the academy because uh, they already assume that Marxism is reductive. It's not. It's a very dialectical outlook um, that sees things in the reciprocal relationality in which it exists. In. And there's this famous uh, um, uh, um, quote that Engels brings up in one of these letters that we repeat all the time, which is what all these gentlemen lack is dialectics. And so um, as I... Uh, get involved in, in political uh, praxis, I, I begin to theorize what I consider to be political mistakes in terms of the ideological foundation that produces uh, certain judgments on political questions and events that I, I think are erroneous. And when I get into uh, really digging into the roots of that foundation, I find that same problem that Engels did, that uh, what all of these share in common is an absence of dialectical thinking. So the purity fetish is a way of formulating in a positive form what that absence is. Um, and I hold that it's concretely, it's, it's, it's rooted in a worldview that only supports uh, um, or, or has this incessant obsession with supporting only that which measures up to some pure idea. Um, I trace this back in the book to uh, the question of change in ancient Greek philosophy, to the debates and the two positions that really arise in um, uh, in, uh, in relation to that question, the side of Heraclitus, which I think we inherit in, through the legacy of Hegel and Marxism, and the side of Parmenides and the Iliadics, which I think has been the dominant one and the one that we find at the foundation of uh, Western Marxism, even if in terms of writings about dialectics, they do a great job when it comes to analyzing the world concretely and applying those writings, even though I don't like the term applying because it feels like you're foisting something onto it, but when it comes to a dialectical analysis of, of the world, um, they often fall within this Parmenidean purity fetish framework, which only supports that, which uh, measures up to some pure idea. And the clear case has been, I think, um, the understanding of socialism. Uh, if there's something that connects really this tradition of Western Marxism has been a clear denunciation of what's uh, often called real socialism uh, for not measuring up to 
the ideals and the conclusions perhaps that were drawn out by Marx at a time in, in history where you couldn't really paint a, conc a concrete picture of what socialism was uh, was going to look like because um, it wasn't anywhere near uh, a, a stage of maturity. And for one to describe something concretely, the object of description also has to be a concrete totality. If it's something that exists in embryo, it's like talking about a person's uh, character when they're three years old. It wouldn't make uh, any sense. So um, they lose sight of so many things. They lose sight of the contradictory uh, character of, of these different developments. They lose sight of the fact that these are processes, that they're, they're things that are in development and, and they're not static, fixed entities. They lose sight of the interconnections in which they exist in. So um, it's very difficult to construct a socialism under global capitalist imperialism that's constantly waging various forms of, of, of warfare against you. Vijay Prashad uses the term hybrid warfare to capture the many forms um, it takes, anything from sanction regimes, which are absolutely crippling. Um, they're, I think, correctly called uh, unilateral coercive uh, uh, measures. Uh, to actual warfare and, and, and invasions and bombing campaigns and uh, terroristic campaigns with paramilitary groups to biological warfare. We just had a researcher into the history of U.S. Uh, imperialist biological warfare. Uh, so they, they really try to overthrow these socialist governments by any means necessary. And I found it completely absurd that we have a tradition that claims to adhere to Marxism, but that condemns all of these projects that have won the struggle for political power for various contradictions that 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 might occur in the presence of all of these external uh, right. pressures. And, uh, but yeah, that's the substance of it, an outlook that uh, only supports that which can measure up to the pure idea of, of what they have in, in their heads. And fundamentally, it's idealist. Uh, when you think about it in terms of the question of socialism, it's utopian. Uh, yeah. much more utopian than, than the scientific socialism that's developed by, by Marxism. And uh, in that sense, there's something reactionary to it because it's taking us back to a framework of analysis that's pre-Marxist. That's really interesting. I mean, two thoughts here. One is, I don't know if you're familiar with Leszek Kołakowski, the, um, the, the great, well, I don't know about great, but the Polish scholar of Marxism, um, where he, in his main currents of Marxism, does a genealogical metaphysical touchstone or kind of origin of marxism in neoplatonism of um plotinus and the reason that it's look that marxism is to be understood as originating from plotinus is because of plotinus is the first to um discuss the possibility of humanity uh finding a reconciliation with the absolute that is within the finitude of the world so therefore marxism the thread of what would become marxism you see marxism becomes alive at that moment and then transfers into the augustinian um cosmos and period of time and lucian goldman also and uh, any uh, lucian goldman was a great student of lukacs and he also in his book the hidden god discusses the same genealogy and uh, it's interesting to me because i think in your framework uh you're pinpointing something which we can debate at the level of the metaphysical influence of Par parmenides and uh, that's an interesting debate to have of course because if we look at like a lamb uh, being an event for example um which would be interesting to compare and contrast that in the in the way that uh, uh, a lot of like marxism after the 68 period for example is actually, you could make an argument, highly Heraclitan in the sense that it's all about difference. So whereas Parmenides has this kind of static, homogeneous thing. So there's, what I like about your book is that um, it opens up all of like a rich uh, sort of prehistory of Marxism is what I like to call it. And, uh, and what I'll say is that I feel like uh, you're making a kind of homage to thinking about the historical origins of Marxism and um, I wanted to ask you if you, um, like, uh, were you planning to sort of um, e engage further on this this thing? Because there's so you've opened up like a Pandora's box because it's a huge topic and you could actually write like 
you know, huge philosophical tracks on these debates. Um, had you thought about like continuing this further? Because I think in general, your point is interesting. And you know what else? Here's my second thing. You know what else it reminds me of? Um, and I wonder if you thought about this. You know, in history and class consciousness, when Lukács says that problem with bourgeois standpoint is that it remains in contemplation. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately it cannot transition to praxis and praxis being a more engaged uh, perspective on the world, which is capable of, of uh, assessing in a practical sense, the subject object dualism, and then therefore dialectics, you see? Um, I don't know if Lukács needs the same prehistory claim that you're making, although maybe he could, you could add that uh, to his kind of uh, argument, but I, I think for him, um, one final thing, sorry, I'm uh, I'm inspired by this question, is that, you know, when Lukács develops the theory of standpoint, you know, a lot of folks don't know, but he really develops it out of his analysis of the background political conditions at the time of 1848, at the time of the Communist Manifesto. Why? Because in the Communist Manifesto, there's a section that people, if you don't know, you should know, uh, is a critique of what Marx and Engels call the true socialists, right? Mm -hmm. And it is that it, it is the true socialists that you see Marx and Engels were a part of. They were a part of this movement, which was uh, the Communist League mostly. It was the Young Hegelians. It was Moses Hess. It was Prodoon. It was kind of a wide uh, panoply of socialist thinkers. What was their error? Their error was. They could not think revolution tethered to what Lukács would call the standpoint of the proletariat. In essence, they, they sort of circumvented the problem of the working class, like in a, in a basic sense. And then you can have that debate, is the proletariat equal the working class? Well, not exactly, but in a sense it does at the same time in this instance, right? So those are some thoughts I have for you, Carlos. But what do you what do you think um, about the the sort of fill this up? Because I think that's the most speculative part of your book. Like you could even walk away reading Purity Fetish and think to yourself, well, I may not agree with him exactly here, but I do think he makes a strong point in general, let's say. Yeah, that was the part that I was trying to limit the most because um, although it's the part that I find the most interesting as, as a philosopher, I'm also writing in a very practical uh, context as someone that, that's involved in struggles. And if I start with a, a 50 page <laughs> chapter on, on these subjects, um, I, I, I know how it's going to be received. Even the, I, I think 20 page uh, um, first chapter on these subjects, there were some people like, why am I, you know, wh why do I have to read about this in order to get to the other part? Um, I think it's necessary and it was necessary to place it there. Um, in part, what I'm replying to is a discussion that Losordo had already originated, that that also Roland Bohr has um, has written on, and that um, the scholars of Losordo, like Jones Manol in, in in Brazil, have also developed, which is uh, the absence of a self conscious of the role that Christianity Christianity in a, in a certain uh, sense of messianism and and purity fetish um, uh, exists within Western Marxists. And so they're seeing it being rooted in, in Christianity. And, and part of what I'm saying is go back deeper. Um, this is it's, it's not it's rooted in Christianity only because um, it gets incorporated from the uh, developments that happened five centuries before the birth of Christ and the discussions between uh, we say discussions as if there were discussions. But in the debates uh, between the uh, Heraclitan tendency and the, um, the Parmenidian one. And I think you're right to a certain extent uh, after uh, 68 um, and maybe you could even say before, uh, perhaps with, a, with a development of, of, of postmodernism and, and certain sort of influences that, that it might have on, on Western Marxism, you do have an explicit uh, 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 recapturing of, of difference. Um, and it becomes almost like a central category for all analysis to the point where sometimes it even uh, precludes the uh, the presence of identity. And instead of thinking 
about identity and difference as dialectically interrelated, interdependent, um, and mutually uh, posited. And um, it, it goes over fully to the to the the camp of difference, if you want to label it as such. Um, but what's interesting is that, and this is why I, I like you bringing up Lukács in terms of the practical application of of these worldviews. When it comes to applying it in praxis, it doesn't matter how good uh, a, a certain text they might have written is on on dialectics, for instance. Uh, I mean, there's people alive now like Kevin Anderson who have done great work on Hegel, um, who I've studied. Uh, but when it comes to analyzing the the real world, uh, you couldn't be more rooted in, in the purity fetish in terms of your, your thinking. It's almost like if dialectics is, is, is tossed out the door, as soon as it becomes a practical affair and something that um, is rooted in not only understanding the world, but also changing it. So um, I, I, I find that in Marcuse, for instance, um, I have a, a longer section of Marcuse. He's my favorite of, of the uh, Western uh, Marxists. I, his book, Reason and Revolution, I, I, I think is one of the ones I always recommend for people just getting started in, into reading Hegel as a secondary source. It's a great text. Uh, he clearly understands dialectics well in that uh, realm. But when it comes to applying it, uh, you see certain comments about the Soviet Union or Vietnam that are just very troublesome. It's like if all dialectics is is, is kept out of the analysis of, of everyday affairs, then um, part of what makes Marxism special as a worldview is that we're not just trying to, to formulate something that is disconnected from our activities in trying to change the world. Uh, that's the whole soul of the 11 thesis that um, one, the idea that we can, you know, just interpret the world without playing some active role in it, it's, it's absurd. That gets debunked in, in the first thesis. Most of the commentary on the 11th, 11th thesis is just so horrific because it ignores the context of the first 10 and the category of praxis or activity that's present in their unifying um, these artificially bifurcated categories of thought uh, and object. But you know, it's it's a consciousness of a self-consciousness, better yet, of the role that our thinking as Marxists has to play in attempting to to change the world and in supporting processes that are uh, attempting to do just that. And that's uh, just fully absent in the Western Marxist tradition. Gabriel Rocco has a a concept that is a, a sort of play on on Michael Parenti. Michael Parenti has the ABC acronym for anything but class theorists. Um, that I think rightfully describes the development of a certain identity politics passing itself off as radical. Gabriel Rocco has the concept of the ABS theorist, which I think describes quite correctly the Western Marxists, which is anything but socialism. If you look at some of their, their writings on socialist states, uh, it's, it's almost as if uh, they end up, in the book I describe it as a form of Thatcherism. It's a, it's a there is no alternative attitude um, where, yes, capitalism is the worst of all systems, but as Churchill said, it's better than all the other ones. Because the, the hatred that they have for, for socialism, I mean, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer readily compared um, many of the leading socialist states and some anti-imperialist states like Nazars, Egypt, uh, to, to fascism. And mm -hmm. fascism is, of course, uh, worse than mm -hmm. capitalism. So it's, it ends up being a compatible left, a left that's uh, very much accepted and, and proliferated by um, the capitalist imperialist ruling class. And uh, if, if, if you're the elite of a system that periodically leads people into um, positions of great despair and discontent, that is uh, an engine force for rebelling against the system, you want an opposition that does not actually support opposing the system. Uh, because it doesn't postulate, postulate any positive alternative. It just simply provides an abstract uh, negation, an abstract. And if we go back to Lukács, very culturalist and a historical uh, critique of, of capitalism. And it's very clear that uh, if you look at the, the, uh, um, the political economy of knowledge, uh, as, as Gabriel Rocco calls it, of, these, uh, of this form of this global theory industry, it's promoted by 
the ruling class for a specific reason. Uh, they, they find it beneficial to have this form of indirect apologetics operative so that it can capture, recuperate uh, the radical descent of, of, of the mass of people that are finding themselves more and more discontented by the way that things are. So it's been really a, a crux to the ruling class surviving even when we get to that point where, as Lenin said, is constitutive of a crisis that the, the people cannot go on living in the old way. Um, right. So, yeah. No, it's good. I mean, I I fully agree that, I mean, it is a sort of conspiracy of silence that Lukács' famous text called The Grand Hotel Abyss, he also wrote a text, this is sort of, so like the Nazis come to power in what, 33, um, on the cusp of their ascension to power, um, you know, Lukács is in Germany as a German specialist, along with um, Karl Korsch and um, Bertolt Brecht, and, you know, Benjamin is around there, and Ernst Bloch, and all of these, um, the godfathers of Western Marxism. And um, Lukács begins to write a series of texts criticizing his fellow Marxists. One of them he calls the new German ideology, right? Mm. So he's sort of playing with the notion that contemporary socialist and communist intellectuals are um, uh, adopting what he calls right-wing epistemology with, um, what is it? You know, it's a uh, right-wing epistemology with left-wing ethics, right? It was a very interesting idea uh, because they are in the Grand Hotel Abyss, which becomes later to be associated with the whole DNA and structure of the Frankfurt School. Which, which Lukács means by that, which is a bunch of intellectuals basically on vacation from social reality um, in purely, pure, you could say, contemplation. Now, a lot of Adorno um, Marxists will push back against that, like, say, folks with Platypus Society and a lot of other Adorno specialists. I mean, I've had Jake and, uh, Jacob uh, Rosenberg on the show, and he would be very upset with me because he, they, they want to claim that Adorno um in negative dialectics and other texts actually gives us a form of marxism that can be compatible with the leninist tradition now that may be a crazy argument for you um it's worth hearing them out right because you see i do think like if you take uh Badiou, uh alain Badiou, i i like to look at marxist thinkers like uh, uh, put them on the scalpel and scalpel up like the parts that work for our struggle and the parts that are regressive or historically irrelevant. For example, Alain Badiou obviously is a Maoist. Maybe he's a post-Maoist. One of the things that he believes in, I think still, is labor aristocracy theory. And that's how he analyzes the condition of the working class in the Western core regions. And I think Midwestern Marx, you guys, uh, Vivek Chibber, myself, and many others reject this idea. So does even Jacobin, and they're social democrats. Because if we are, if we, if we accept labor aristocracy, which is basically that the the the, the working class are pass is a pacified agency. What I mean, in simple terms, what do we have left? Right, like how how do we do politics? I want to get your thoughts on that. Actually, yeah, that's very interesting. Um... I, I like the term that you use, scalp, like remove the parts, because um, uh, uh, the the I frame it in a very similar uh, way, in um, in a sort of Gramscian way, which is capture, recapture the rational kernels that are there, disarticulate them from their current worldview, and rearticulate them uh, in in a Marxist uh, worldview. Um, so I, I think that the origin as as far back as I could trace it, of the labor aristocracy theory treated in the way that it's treated by someone like Badiou and by modern day Maoists and, and third world is not in the Leninist formulation that it's really this, this upper stratum of the organized working class that sells out the interests of the working class as a whole, not just the international working class, but the one in their countries for the sake of a few crumbs uh, from the imperialist super profits, which I think that term still stands. Like uh, you look at the AFL-CIO, um, it's, it becomes evident. Um, but as, uh, as the whole working class um, constituting in the West, a labor aristocracy in relationship to the working class in the global South, 
The earliest I could trace that to is Mark, uh, Marcuse's Soviet Marxism, where he brings forth a critique of Lenin. Uh, and he says that one of the central uh, things that Lenin misses is how in the West, the labor aristocracy is the whole working class. Um, and so it, it has to be almost like a deeply third worldist uh, program. And this might sound radical. It might sound um, uh, like it, it might sound radical, but in, in substance, all it does is force us to, to sit with our hands in our pockets and not do anything. Because if we have no potential to change anything because we, we're benefiting from the system, we're fully absorbed in it, uh, what do we do? We just wait around for the third world to come and save us somehow? Do we just petition China to invade the U.S.? Like, it's so weird. What do you do? And it's so contrary to what um, actual communist struggles in the global south want. Uh, they want us to get our shit together. They want us to overthrow our ruling class because our ruling class is the one stepping on their... Excuse, can I drop F-bombs here, by the way? Yeah, of course, of course. I, I drop yeah. them with quite frequent... I drop them in class. The students are like, wow. <laughs> They're the ones that want us to get our fucking shit together because it's our ruling class, the one that is is preventing and stifling their struggles more than any other uh, factor. They're the ones that are funding the opposition elements within their countries. And there's this famous uh, scene that I I, I, um, I reference quite often of Michael Hart in the movie Examined Life, where he's in a canoe and they're interviewing him and he's talking about having gone to Nicaragua to talk to the Sandinistas. And he says, I'm here to help. How can I help? And they tell him, you want to help? Back Go home. the fuck back home. Go the fuck back home and have a revolution there. He's like, I don't even know how to how to, how to think about that, how to do that. So um, I, I think ultimately what positions like this do is uh, place us in what Kedi Shukrov called a, a, a form of radicalizing the impossibility of exit. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that I, I, I know uh, J.B. Foster, who, who we've both talked to, um, emphasizes in his discussion of like the modern forms of indirect apologetics. Uh, uh, but sounds a lot like, sounds a lot like Deleuze and Guattari. Yeah. 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 So it's, I mean, ultimately if, if, if a form of theory can't be used to help us advance the, the class struggle, what's the purpose of it? I mean, I can enjoy reading it as a philosopher, exactly. as a hobby, but. Although let me, let me share one point apropos Badiou's analysis of Leninism as a tradition, which you may or may not be familiar with. We did a whole program um, dedicated to Badiou's comrade, um, Sylvain Lazarus. Very interesting uh, Maoist French communist um, wrote, a, wrote a very challenging book called Anthropology of the Name. And if you uh, want to understand the heart of Alain Badiou's politics, you have to start with Lazarus. Uh, because Lazarus is kind of the militant that actually did like that. Well, they both do. Actually, Badiou does to his credit. Uh, there's a great book coming out on Badiou's um, position in 68 because Badiou's position in the 68 uprising was go to the go to the fucking factories. Like, you know, and that's what he did. And um, I was beaten by police and um, his comrades were taken to jail. I mean, so he's a serious, um, he's not some kind of armchair academic. But what he and Lazarus uh, discover in about the 1990s, as neoliberalism really becomes concrete in the social relations and in the political struggles, is that, um, you know, this notion of the um, workers' inquiry, right? Where you sort of go into the factory and you begin to organize amongst the workers, classic Maoist strategy and so on. And one of the things they learned there, right, was neoliberalism after having gutted the the uh, hegemony of um, labor unions and even at the level of discourse they use discourse analysis of um, the meaning of the word worker uh it, it lost its edge and so the possibility of organizing militancy in the factory receded and then they witnessed um the polish solidarity movement which was a liberal uprising against uh, the remnants of um, Polish communist bureaucracy. But Badiou said something very interesting about the Polish Solidarity Movement, which was it was a liberalist movement that was using the tactics of Lenin against the old remnants of... And Badiou, upon witnessing this 
insane historical contradiction, says to himself, wait a second, to be a communist, this is why Baju is such an, a strange communist. To be a communist means that we must subtract our political action entirely from the kind of matrices of bourgeois institutions, because within them, liberalism has won. So we, you see my point. And so there's certain, again, we're, we're thinking scalpel wise, right? There's something very interesting about this uh, diagnosis. Now you may, I mean, I'd like to see what you think about it. Or you may disagree, but you see his point is, yeah, I'm still a Leninist, but tact, but the, in the realm of strategy and tactics, which is really what Leninism is about. Leninism is, is about political strategy, right? But you says we we have reached a point of what they call saturation in the mode of doing Leninist politics. And um, anyways, um, it's a challenge to Lenin. And it, well, it's something that I think Marxist Leninists today should read and should be challenged by. Because one of the things I believe in, that's why I had you on the show, is that we need to challenge each other. Um, you know, not only in organizing and starting a party, like that's a necessity, but in these realms of theory. So I don't know if you're that familiar with Baju's politics and stuff like that, but perhaps that might dignify him a little bit more to you. And I don't mean to like pump him up too much, but I do think he does also, I will say also, stand somewhat as an exception to Western Marxism writ large. Like there are some figures who have, uh, let's say their roots in Western Marxism, but perhaps also have produced work which exceeds it. You know what I'm saying? Not to mention the fact that the founder of Western Marxism, in a way, is Lukács. Uh, but he broke from them, right? Because Lukács was messianic and he was romantic, anti-capitalist. He was Nietzschean even for a certain time. So uh, I'm just trying to say that perhaps um, there are some salvageable figures. I mean, once you get to post-Marxism with like Leclau and Mouffe, that's a whole different world. You know what I'm saying? I, they need to be treated separately as a separate problem, in my opinion, because it's even more um, un-Marxist in some sense. But I don't know if you have any thoughts on that reflection. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I, I do have a, a special place for um, Badiou, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but Shishak too, even though I hate absolutely hate his politics. And I agree fully with uh, Rocco that in many ways he's a, a court gesture of empire for in, in the realm of politics. Well, I mean, th just one th thing on the Zizek, we just have to honor one thing. Um, how many people he's turned into young leftist intellectuals? Myself a included. Lot, lot. That's why. A lot. <laughs> That's why um, I'm embarrassed to say it, but it's true. I'd, I'd be a hypocrite if I, if I didn't mention it because when I was uh, getting into uh, Marxism, reading my Marx, Engels, Lenin, I obviously wanted to see who I could find that was alive, that was a philosopher like myself. And I found Badiou and Shisha. And that's why I started reading. And I think in, in certain key theoretical issues, for instance, in the, the understanding of ideology, I may disagree with Shisha a whole lot, but I, I think his understanding of ideology is amongst the best um, uh, that, uh, that we have today in terms of Marxist theorists. And in terms of Badiou, I, I mean, I, I have them in my syllabus for, for my intro to philosophy class. I have in Praise of Love, a nice little uh, text that, that he, um, where he provides his analysis on love, which is really um, an extension of, of his understanding of the event and uh, uh, ethics as a fidelity to the event. It's the same thing, but with the encounter, the, the love encounter is like the event. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's there's rational kernels that we can capture from from all of these uh, thinkers, um, which could be dislocated from perhaps an overarching worldview that's rooted in, in in Western Marxism. I also don't think a lot of these people, perhaps I'm wrong, are like self consciously trying to be a, a objectively counter revolutionary. I think there's a goodwill to be. Um, actual revolutionaries and it's it's part of that contradiction where I, I would perhaps classify them objectively doing work that is stifling the class struggle but them subjectively attempting to do work that advances it that produces here and there the rational kernels that we can pull from i think in terms of um bourgeois institutions it's very interesting so the soviets of course uh w without the building of dual power um 
the revolution would have been virtually impossible. Um, and from the Gramscian tradition, which I, I, I consider myself very much a part of, because I just see it as the Leninist tradition as well. I don't try to separate it as many in the academy do. Uh, from the Gramscian tradition, there's a clear understanding that in order to build working class hegemony or counter hegemony, which is a, a post Gramscian term, um, you need to set up institutions because uh, ideas are always embodied. They're embodied in people and in, and in institutions. And you need working class institutions that can challenge the hegemonic ones. Um, so if we think of operating outside of bourgeois institutions in that sense, I, I completely agree. Part of how I think about what the Institute is doing is precisely that, like a working class institution, almost like a think tank for um, a counter hegemonic politics. Um, I think there's some institutions, bourgeois institutions that as Lenin used to say, although they have become superfluous in the lens of universal history, like elections, parliamentary elections, they're not superfluous for the people, uh, just yet at least. And communists should be in there um, waging the, the battle of ideas. There's other institutions in which I think we should be waging the battle of ideas. One of my recent areas of, of work has been thinking about the role that social media plays as a contemporary ideological field. And it's very clear that these are bourgeois institutions through and through. It's, it's Silicon Valley and um, you know, Musk, one of the richest uh, people on the planet, who control and uh, have at will the capacity to censor, to mm -hmm. boost some content, to uh, repress others and shadow ban. But it is a place where, on average, people are spending you know, three to four hours on, and it's extremely influential in how people uh, think about their everyday politics. So if the, the schools are perhaps a foundation, the ideological foundation for the worldviews that people are, are, are develop, uh, it's social media today, I think, the one that really brings it home in terms of uh, daily events. There's, of course, a tubular character to it. There's leakages and, and like what we're seeing with Palestine, where, um, you know, you can have uh, Musk put 30 things on top of uh, Rafa when 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 Rafa had millions of, of tweets. There was 30 things that were on top that had only thousands of, of, of tweets, but people are still sharing it. But the, the point of it is it's that it's a bourgeois institution, but it's still a site of ideological struggle, a place where we have to wage the war of position. So I'm not sure whether um, that's what you were referring to with with Badi's point about yeah, bourgeois institutions. It is. It is because it, in a sense for him, um, the prescription was actually to organize immigrants, actually. Mm -hmm. And this is where he develops his theory of the nomadic proletariat. And this is why actually, because um, I've done a lot of work on Badgie, right? I've done, a lot of work, I've done a lot of work on his politics. There's some admirable things. For example, um, in the Congo and in South Africa, you have um, black working class uh, movements Badu that are Bajuian in some sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shack Dwellers Movement in South Africa, Wamba Dia Wamba in the Congo. Um, and he begins to um, organize with um, undocumented workers in France and uh, does rent strikes. Um, but what I gather from a, in an American context is exactly what you're saying, which is the importance of building um, working class uh institutions and and i think that one of the problems with that is that we and i find i, I run across this a lot on the left which is um a lingering hangover and i want to ask you actually about how you assess the causes of this problem well like let's say carlos and daniel are are saying you know hypothetically that um you know the task of the left is to build working class institutions right i often feel that folks respond to that uh, claim or that to that demand with a certain um, sense that, well, is that reactionary? And in, in other words, how I see it, and tell me how you see it, Carlos, uh, a lot of folks on the left think that if you want to do like sort of working class center politics, it's regressive. Um, you're hearkening back to some kind of form of capitalism, which no longer exists. Um, you are, you are deprivileging um, other uh, oppressed groups when you folks, so they, so, so you have to have that debate with folks. And I, I try to, 
uh, like my last show was on this question where um, all of that, like what I call um, micropolitics on the left, uh, that's one an uh, form that this takes, but there's a certain allergy and a certain um, uh, resistance that you will face if you, if you stake down a claim that we actually want to do class politics seriously in this country. And so it's not easy work. It's not easy work. Um, now, one of the things that you have pointed out is that institutionally, we should understand the repressive apparatus of the CIA. And I'm not going to go too far down this line, but I think it's worth mentioning for folks that aren't aware of it, of what's called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Right. Now, um, the Congress for Cultural Freedom is an extremely important um, and an institution which has lasting effects. I want to invite you to say something about it um, in a broad perspective, right? Um, it's, it's basically a, 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 well, Henry Kissinger called it, um, you know what he called it? The, um, the American aristocracy. It's like, it's a very interesting concept, especially if we think of Bonapartism as a, as a, as, Lu, as Lucerto teaches us in his new book on Bonapartism, not new, newly released, uh, for, for Lucerto, Bonapartism is about a retaining bourgeois and aristocratic interests mm -hmm. and so kissinger calls a congress of cultural freedom aristocracy that's fucking fascinating to me but that's exactly what it is that's exactly what it is and that's exactly when um um you you have that that theory of hyper imperialism or was it super imperialism you know this theory from what's this? hudson is it michael hudson? oh hudson is super imperialism are there super imperialism to well, Hudson's framework of super imperialism puts forward the thesis that part of the objective of that is to entrench forms of uh, regressive aristocracy in the in the global south and in the developing right. world. Mm -hmm. You see the point. So its imperialism is part of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. But tell us about its its sort of uh, design and its influence, please. Well, there was a conscious effort um, in the Cold War period when the Soviet Union is very clearly playing an incredibly positive role in anti-colonial struggles throughout the global south and um, becoming very attractive to prominent left-wing intellectuals, uh, primarily people like uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, um, Simone de Beauvoir, and others in, in, in the French scene. R Richard Wright in the U.S. Richard Wright in the U.S., um, even though he flips after, but he flips, uh, and, he flips. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in the context of the almost like ruling intelligentsia, the most uh, um, influential ideologues um, turning towards sympathy with the Soviet Union, the American uh, ruling class in cahoots with the British and, and uh, the other sort of junior imperialist powers. Uh, they decide to set up explicitly institutions and journals and magazines and uh, that can prop up what they call a compatible left, a left uh, that, um, yes, criticizes cap capitalism, sometimes does it in a very culturalist form, sometimes sustains somewhat of a, a class analysis, but is always anti-communist, is always against uh, actual existing socialism which is really the, the central enemy of, uh, of the imperialist ruling class. So, I mean, uh, billions were, uh, were put in the service of promoting these magazines that circulated in hundreds of thousands around the world. A lot of the um, uh, more prominent uh, thinkers that um, are propped up as radical in the Western Academy were people who were proliferated throughout these... Um, throughout these efforts, that doesn't mean that they are consciously acting in the interests of the CIA. They are just uh, sort of the, um, Gabriel Rocco described it um, in, in our program as they're the, they're the uh, theater actors that were given a stage. Um, James Baldwin is one, yeah. Unfortunately. Which is really, yeah, really bad, really sad because I mean, he's in some sense a kind of prophetic literary genius, yes. poetic yeah. genius, right? Yeah. And, you know, as a black intellectual, he's sort of, I mean, that's all that he had available right. because the money in the arts world 
say say you're working class black intellectual i mean <laughs> somebody gives you a chance what are you going to say mm. right so it's not right. their fault it's not their fault exactly like okay, right. i i agree with you we shouldn't be thinking about it like that that's why this is not uh, it's not a conspiracy in this kind of neat kinetic right. way and it subjectivizes the the analysis of what's a systematic phenomenon when you treat it in in that way as just a series of individuals and I mean, I think Baldwin is the the perfect example of someone who, even if he was a, a, a part of that, there's definitely a lot of rational kernels that um, that that could be extracted, um, and that maybe don't even have to be extracted because they're already in a in a pretty rational and, and compatible worldview to the ones that we have. Our our friends over at the Saturday Free School for Philosophy and Black Liberation they um, are having the Year of Baldwin. They just launched a, a podcast on it and. I would consider them as far as possible away from from the tradition of the the Congress for for cultural freedom. But um, it's important for, uh, for for us to understand that ideas don't just exist in this sort of transcendental realm. They're they're always embodied and incarnated in people and institutions. And the ruling class knows that if it wants compatible left ideas, ideas that I call it in the book, um, controlled forms of counter hegemony. If it wants those to exist which if we agree with Lukács, it has become a necessity, a form of indirect apologetics. Um, it needs to put money down and, and, and promote these sorts of institutions and journals and magazines. And that's what the Congress for, for Cultural Freedom was. It was this great project to challenge the communist left from a um, compatible, propped up, uh, pro-imperialist um, West uh, left. And I also wanted to, to get back at the point you're making earlier about uh, folks today considering that it's reactionary to build working class centered politics. I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's so many of my colleagues that have just lost complete faith in, in what's called the left um, in the U.S. precisely because of this. This has nothing to do with the genuine uh, left, right? If we think of left in terms of moving history forward, it has to be rooted in class analysis because the nucleus of the movement of history the engine is that uh, class contradiction at the, the foundation of, of society. So as, as soon as you start focusing on these micro politics that are being thought through in a way that's disconnected from, from class uh, uh, struggle, you move yourself away from anything that's even remotely left, especially when you understand the role that this form of ABC, anything but class theory plays in, um, in, in sustaining capitalist hegemony and preventing alternative forms of uh, Marxist class analysis from uh, rooting itself as the uh, genuine counter hegemonic uh, ideas of, of, a, of a time. Um, it also shows a poverty at the level of philosophy um, in thinking dialectically. Uh, it, it shows a, an inability to understand the dialectical relation between the universal and particular. Um, because class struggle is a universal, uh, which means from the dialectical tradition, not that it exists the same way throughout space and time as universals are treated in the history of Western philosophy, but that it is universal precisely in the fact that it takes various particular forms in accordance with various contexts. And mm -hmm. so the famous phrase from the manifesto is not the history of, 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 of uh, the, the history of Herthel existing societies is the history of class struggle. It's the history of right. class struggles, plural. Right. Because it takes right. a variety of different determinate forms. Engels talked about the struggle against patriarchy being the first one and the origins right. of the family, private property, and the state. Uh, Marx describes the civil rights, I mean the civil rights, the, the struggle against slavery in the U.S. South right. in the 1860s as a form of class struggle. He talks right. about national liberation as a form of class struggle. So um, Losoro describes this very well in his book, Class Struggles. Uh, and he categorizes yeah. it as genus and, and species. And what these people do is um, they look at these various struggles in a very disconnected and undialectical and ahistorical form, which is unable to see how, for instance, the struggle against racism in the U.S. has been a form of class struggle. It's been a struggle Absolutely. of uh, the black proletariat against capital quite explicitly, but it's also been a struggle against that poison, which divides the, the working class. And uh, Marx called it literally in his writings on the Irish, uh, on English racism against the Irish. 
He right. called it the secret weapon through which the ruling class sustains power. So if you're fighting right. the secret weapon of the ruling class, how are you going to tell me that's not a class struggle? Um, right. So. Yeah, it's like in my last show, we, we said there's three preeminent thinkers. If you want to understand why socialism has never fully taken off in the United States, the first is W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, because that's a book about the attempt of dictatorship of proletariat by black working class because marx and i always say this so part pardon my listeners marx said that the theory of class struggle is not his original idea the bourgeois economy had discovered that idea but he adds my original idea is dictatorship of proletariat mm -hmm. i feel like that's something i kind of want to like um put up on like um the you know like um like Plato's Academy, uh, yeah, those, right, those right. who do not know geometry do not enter. That would be like Marx's Academy. Um, <laughs> but 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 you see, that doesn't mean that the concept of dictatorship of proletariat is static. Right, right. It means that as Marxist, we need to reinvestigate it today. It's not the same as it was. Uh, so anyways, there's Du Bois, then there's Werner Sombart, uh, who wrote this book about why socialism never took place in America. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting text, um, dealing a lot with um, um, kind of uh, internal dynamics to to the white proletariat, to Protestantism, to Protestant ideology, and so on. And then there's um, Louis Hartz's book, which I have a certain sympathy for, uh, called The Liberal Tradition in America. And in that book, um, he makes an argument, which is that uh socialism has been really fucking hard in this country because the american revolution was founded and this is his analysis you may disagree i think you do disagree actually he thinks the american revolution was a bourgeois revolution and even though we had slave enslavement of people of of black people and so on even though he says that was a reality he says in the world of the social antagonisms that generated the the foundation of the country it was largely the interest of the bourgeois class and that like the working class was a sliver and that moreover, unlike French Revolution and so on, uh, America didn't have long lasting relations of feudal rivalries mm -hmm. and dependencies and antagonisms. And he says that for this reason, uh, America has been kind of terminally bourgeois in its state power. And he's and he goes on, he says, once the working class really became an active force in political life say the 1840s, 1860s, 1850s, which is when the Republican Party was founded. He says at that moment, um, uh, well, he has this theory of what he calls algerism, which is this like insidious ideology that has a racial component to it, by the way, because it's a basic premise is um, what would become the notion of American dream or what would become the notion of the bootstrap ideology. Like you are working class, but we're going to give you the illusion of your social mobility if you work very hard and you follow the diligent Protestant protocols and so on. Um, and it, anyways, um, that became the heart of the Republican Party. And he even says that this continued under FDR because he makes this point that FDR represents the single largest expansion of private property in human history mm. because it was the it was the liberalization of this social mobility idea. Anyways, uh, it's a, it's worth looking at those three texts. I mean, I think Du Bois is the most important there. Um, thoughts on that, like on the history of, I know you've thought about this a lot, Carlos, you know, why has socialism not really taken off in America? What's your best analysis on this? Well, in, in a way, the purity fetish is a, a text to help us think through that question today. Um, and uh, we have a pamphlet coming out from another one of the directors of the Institute called Reproletarianization, the Rise and Fall of the American Middle Class, that seeks to understand that from the perspective of the middle to late, to not late, middle uh, of the 20th century. And then I've also written on, on Du Bois as a way to understand that um, basically from everything uh, before. It's a, an extremely important question. I was uh, actually just writing about um, Sombart's why, why is there no socialism in the U.S. Uh, before we, we got on the call? Um, and I think there's there's something to all of these uh, hypotheses. 
I find that the one that has been the most influential um, has uh, for uh, from 1864 back, right, from the civil rights movement back. I think there's a qualitative shift there. Um, we call it the Third American Revolution, a, a political revolution of sorts that removes this underclass, at least a jure, and creates the material conditions for a transformation in the social consciousness of the American people, such that I think today uh, it's it's the case that much more people, especially younger folks, uh, are a lot more likely to be anti-racist than racist. And that just creates the most fertile ground that we've ever had for um, multiracial working class politics. But before 64, um, it's racism that's ex explicitly dividing the working class and it's um, it's a cancer. It's a form of, I describe it in my work as a form of false consciousness. Um, it couldn't be a clearer case of, of false consciousness where you take a very superficial truth, you know, the pigmentation of our skin to be this substantial um, uh, thing that grounds your interest. And then the substantial thing that actually grounds your interest, your class position, you take it to be something secondary. It's an inversion of reality, a turning of reality on its head. For us, Du Bois is central. We, we, we call him the father of American Marxism. When we have the heads of Marxism, um, we always put Du Bois in there um, because he is for us, the, even though there's, of course, Marxists before uh, in the U.S., they all seem to be copying and pasting Marxist analysis. Um, du Bois is for us the first person to genuinely apply the method, um, to work through on the basis of the dialectical materialist worldview, and provide us a concrete analysis of the determinant forms that the class struggle has taken here in the U.S. And that has been for many years a, uh, a, a struggle which has taken the form of the Black Freedom Movement, of the struggle against racism, first in the abolition of, of slavery, which was the largest expropriation of property uh, this side of the Western Hemisphere till this day, um, which established on the basis of the the Freedmen's Bureau with the backing of the Northern Federal Government, what he calls a dictatorship of the working class in the U.S. South, which upheld not only the interests of the black proletariat, but also of the poor Southern white. You know, we celebrate every year the Paris Commune, as we should, but we don't really celebrate the dictatorship of the working class that came before the Paris Commune, and that lasted almost uh, a decade, so uh, uh, quite a bit uh, uh, more than than the Paris Commune. Um but go ahead. I see you muted. Amazing. No, I mean, it's amazing because there's this new book on called the St. Louis Commune. I don't know if you all have interviewed the author, um, but uh, Weidemeyer, uh, the, the, the general, the German general who was um, a comrade of Marx, very close, was a Marxist. Uh, he he uh, followed Engels' advi advice to establish an enclave of communists in St. Louis very intentionally. Mm -hmm. And they did that. And um, there's this book about um, their execution of the St. Louis Commune, which was led by his son, Weidemeyer's son. Mm. Ar Marx, is, um, Marx was his mentor, right? He basically said, look, like LaSalle in an interesting, because people don't understand, like LaSalle is like super problematic figure. Like Lukács uh, has this essay on LaSalle because you see one of the things that happened, I think, in the, in the uh, 20s, maybe, the, yeah, like the, the, the mid 20s is LaSalle's letters became available. Mm -hmm. And what we learned from his letters is that LaSalle thought himself literally like a Nietzschean Superman. <laughs> and then Lukács actually says, this is like Nietzschean socialism. It's like mm -hmm. a perverted idea of a kind of uh, person because he's exchanging letters with this very wealthy woman that was his uh, uh, love affair or whatever. And she was pumping LaSalle's ego to thinking that he's some messianic figure for the working class. It's a side point. Um, but um but yeah man i mean this stuff is so uh it's so important to read du bois's work and even i mean we're doing a big program if you can come you know in, on uh, clr james who's another black marxist who comes to america and is in ellis island right basically um in exile trying to get acceptance to america and you know what he does is he writes a play about herman melville and then he writes an essay con, uh, on American civilization. And he sends this play to every co uh, member of uh, the Senate, I think, maybe Congress, and says, uh, will you please give me citizenship? I have mm -hmm. just written this play about the greatest American writer. And this is why I think that his values are compatible 
with my own and he's uh he's a communist and uh anyways he 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 does uh enter america and plays a very formative role we can disagree with some of the things that clr james ultimately does and things of this nature but nonetheless his his uh, position there is an interesting one in terms of black marxists in the us i think um but on Du Bois, um, if we could, I had a question there because one of the texts I really want to read, Carlos, is um, Adolf Reed's analysis of Du Bois as practically um, a Fabian socialist, which I found mm -hmm. interesting because so many communists today find inspiration from Black Reconstruction, which of course they should. But uh, as I understand it, Reed is kind of saying, look, well, when push comes to shove, um, we're dealing with a figure who was affiliated with the Communist Party, but also was strategic. He sort of towed a social democracy line. So that's a very interesting thesis that uh, I wanted to consider. I don't know if you've encountered Reed's book. It's a bit of maybe perhaps a controversial thesis. I don't know. Yeah, no, I... Um, well, du, du Bois, uh, the earliest I can track of him being a socialist was when he did his grad school in Berlin and he was in close contact with the uh, Social Democratic Party there. Uh, he comes back, he joins the Socialist Party in very early, I want to say 1904 or something, um, either right after its founding or, or, or something like that. He's, he leaves fairly quickly because um, they don't see the the role of the black freedom movement as a as a class struggle along with other things but um du bois socialism has various epochs um, i think that if you look at his earliest works there's an implicit marxism that's operative because he's very much focusing on how ideas arise out of material institutions um, and how those institutions are in a constant state of development so you have the materialism and then you have the dialectics um, it's not conscious of its of itself yet. It isn't until the Great Depression that Du Bois goes back and reads his Marx, Engels, Lenin, um, and begins to almost like concretize um, in a very self conscious manner the implicit ideas that he almost intuitively used in his studies. I mean, you could read uh, the Souls of Black Folk, and it, it's it's very clearly not explicitly a Marxist text. But there's Marx's under themes all, all throughout it. Um, the Fabian socialism comment, I see it perhaps more rooted in the fact that he was very much um, in favor of, uh, of worker and consumer cooperatives in a way that's kind of reminiscent of like uh, uh, Dr. Richard Wolff now. Um, interestingly enough, uh, that has been a huge tendency in American socialism. I do a lot of research in the 1820s uh, and 30s and the uh, tradition of, of Jeffersonian socialists and people who participated in utopian experiments that became very critical of them and, and developed an attempted scientific socialism. So not just an escape of capitalism, but an attempt to work through it and find what constitutive elements within the social totality can allow us to create a, a new world. All of them end up postulating something akin to um, the possibility of, of, of cooperative societies. So Du Bois is working from that framework, and it's not until the 30s that he has that transition, but he doesn't <laughs> have it in the way that you know previous Marxists uh, had it, where they just accepted the analysis. He developed upon it, and I, the way I think of Marxism is as a worldview that's open, because its object of study is constantly developing, and it understands this. If, if we can speak about a dialectical materialist ontology, part of what it includes is the fact that it's an ontology of becoming, of, of something that's in a constant state of flux and progress. So the worldview itself and the insights have to constantly be developed creatively. And Du Bois does that, unlike anyone else, I think, uh, before him. And um, so I, I don't think the, the Fabian socialism applies to the post-30 uh, Du Bois. And... Uh, I, th I also don't think that there's like a split. I mean, he does read Marx, but uh, what uh, comes after was already implicit in what was before. It's not like this radical break. Um, so. Yeah, very cool. You've you've done your you've done your work on Du Bois. I I admire that. 
as a side point, I just learned recently that I have a relative on my father's side called Josiah Warren, who was oh, a, yeah. a pro-Dunist, utopian socialist who actually started a commune community yeah, yeah, in yeah. America. Uh, you may have heard of him. He's fairly yeah. well known. Um, so, you know, so American socialism, I guess, is in my in my family history. Right. And um, of course, my father is terrified by that because he's not a socialist, but that's, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, yeah, brother, this is great, man. It's so nice to have you on the show, Carlos, and to discuss these um, these lines of mutual interest of ours. Um, one question I had was. Um, um, in reading like um, Los Cerdo and also perhaps if you've gotten to the section in my book on Rosentiment, um, one of the things you say about Western Marxism is that there is a problem of Rosentiment. And yeah. I, in my book, you may or may not know, have a kind of, uh, well, rather let's put it, I propose that as a construct, Rosentiment is kind of um, problematic. And mm -hmm. I can explain why I think that. However, I want to give you a sense of um, articulating your your conception of of Rousantiment. and for listeners, Rousantiment is a um, is not created by Nietzsche. Uh, it's like a Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard, and then Nietzsche and others uh, bring it out. But it has a very, I mean, speaking as like the genealogy of a concept, Lucerto shows us and others have shown us that it does have a sort of problematic origin. But nonetheless, I wonder if you, how you treat it or how you think of it now. Um, uh, because I know that you rely on Max Scheller's book yeah. on Rosentiment. Um, so how does, how does Rosentiment function for you perhaps as a concept? Like what are its strengths? Or upon reflection, do you think that perhaps it is? Do you agree with me that it's problematic? And then, and then, second, like, how does this concept actually apply to today's um, left, what you call compatibilist left? So that question on Rosentimon is very interesting. I've done quite a few interviews on the book, and I don't think I've ever been asked about Rosentimon. So I, if I had to bet money, I, I would have guessed it would have been you to be the the first one to to ask me on it. Um, I think it's a helpful concept because uh, in my personal interactions with a lot of Western Marxists, specifically people within the academy, there is, of course, a component of it that's that's rooted in in, in their worldviews, uh, and that's part of what the purity fetish helps us understand. Like, what are those ways of thinking that lead to these uh, judgments about social estates, or what part of the working class is revolutionary, which one is not, or American history. But there's an emotive component to it as well. There's a passion, a passionate anti-communism. Uh, and the way that I read it is that a lot of these people are very dogmatic Marxists. They read the early Marx. They see the ideas that, uh, the, the more Eurocentric ideas of, of an early Marx, that socialism was bound to first happen in the industrial parts of the world, specifically Western Europe. We know he changes these um, when he starts studying um, uh, anthropology, Kovalevsky, he gets into, uh, there's the famous Vera Sasulich letter, the debate with Mikhailovsky, the Russian populist, um, which he never sends. He writes, and we have the manuscripts of, but uh, there's the idea that, well, we in the West are the first ones that are supposed to have the revolution and then the rest of the world is supposed to follow. But the Western Marxist sees that it's it's been upside down. And uh, I, I think that part of the passionate uh, critique or dismissal of, of socialism that has taken root in the global South, it's almost uh, a transvaluation of, of values. Um, I reject it on the basis of it was us who were supposed to get it first. They got it first and therefore it's sour grapes. It's not actually socialism because I've been impotent to it. Um, it's it's not actually uh, socialism, which is the, the most common expression you hear from, from Western Marxists when they're asked about one of the socialist uh, countries of, of the past or present. It's not actually socialism. Um, the, the grapes aren't aren't sweet they're, they're they're pretty sour so um it was a part of the book that i was debating whether to add or not i think uh i think it's valuable and i see it in other areas 
as well. Um, I wrote a, a paper recently for the Substack on environmental neo-Malthusianism. And uh, there was these comments that I, I don't know if you saw them, Daniel, when the pandemic started in, in 2020. There was environmental leftists um, coming out and saying the humanity is the sickness, uh, the pandemic is the cure. And it was very weird because you saw it conjoined with people who were sharing images of like rivers that now had fish going through it because, you know, uh, commerce stopped and the economies were shut down. And what I ended up seeing was that there was this distorted love for nature that was really rooted in a sort of Malthusian um, hate for humanity. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was a, a love that was premised on hate in the same way that, um, I guess, if you're Nietzsche, you would say that um, the good is premised on a transvaluation of that which has just been categorized as evil. The evil is categorized first, and then the good comes along with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, two things come to mind before we talk about Rose Antimont. Your, your comment regarding the pandemic is interesting because we did see, um, coming from like a French thinker like Jean-Luc Nancy, he has this idea of um, uh, the, that the pandemic uh, opened a window to a future communistic social arrangement. Mm -hmm. And Judith Butler said something similar. And it's sort of a kind of post-class liberal version of communism. Mm -hmm. And insofar as it ultimately is not a communism that I'm familiar with, right? It's not a communism of a kind of radical freedom or interested in the liberation of the working class. It's quite perhaps, um, and I want to be delicate here because again, we think about Lucerto has this concept of theoretical surplus from Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that Lucerto, uh, rest in peace, uh, if he were alive, would get upset with you for using the concept, even though he knows Nietzsche better than <laughs> anyone. But just to be clear, just to be clear, because I, I, I also hold the view that Nietzsche, if you read my book, is a deeply problematic thinker, but actually mm -hmm. has a theoretical surplus that can yeah. be used if you are cunning and if you are careful. Okay, the way that you're using Rezontimon, by the way, is different than, than how Nietzsche would use it, in my opinion, because for Nietzsche, there is a reactionary way to use Rezontimon, which mm -hmm. is basically a reference to envy. Right, that that the, right. Su the the men of Rosentiment are subjects that are kind of overwhelmed by envy, jealousy, and revenge. Mm -hmm. And you know who he associates that with is uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Chartist movement, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Jacobins, mm -hmm. uh, utopian socialism. Right, he 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 makes a claim on the entirety of the left. Now, here's a very interesting point where you see a sort of seeming coalescence between Marx and Nietzsche, because M Marx is also a strident critic of, of the left, of socialism. I don't know why it does that stupid thing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, you see my point. So you can kind of have that careful homologous or parallel conversation. And I think that for a thinker like Scheller, whose book on Ressentiment you, you lean on, gives us a very interesting, but by the way, it's a, it's a reverse of Nietzsche, yep. because... Yep. Uh, uh, he wants to argue that Nietzsche misread Christianity and he wants to retain an aristocratic vision of Christianity and so on. So there's a lot to piece through there. And I think that, um, let's put it this way. The best way I think, the best thinker on Rosentiment and transvaluation of all values is actually Huey Newton, surprisingly, mm. because Huey Newton, in my section on Newton, it's uh, he performs a very nice reading. Where the issue is um, how resentments affect the working class, in this case, the black working class and black lumpen proletariat. And the way that that works is the internalization of values that only foment passivity, mm. right? So in that sense, Nietzsche gives us a certain toolbox for the radicalization of passive consciousness. So you can actually take Nietzsche, if you're very careful, like a scalpel, and, and Nietzsche becomes an aid uh, uh, to a paradoxical comrade to the activation of proletarian consciousness. That's actually what I argue, okay? Now, I think what you're talking about is slightly different. It's more a uh, resentiment of a kind of petty bourgeois situation mm -hmm. where they're in between class positions and there's a kind of, in psychoanalytic sense, maybe you could say even an ambivalence 
um, regarding action, regarding um, a willingness of militancy and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not discarding your use of it. I'm just saying I'm urging caution is all I'm trying yes. to say. That, yeah. It's very interesting because the, the way that you're um, using it is similar to uh, one of our writers. He's a, a philosophy professor in Peru. When Pedro Castillo got elected, the cosmopolitan established left um, criticized him and his, his and his movement as rooted in resentment and as uh, just a, a rabble, basically. And he got in a debate with the leading thinker that was bringing forth uh, that charge. It was like two or three back and forths. And he defended resentment in uh, the, the peasantry and in the working class as potential um, as something that could potentially activate a form of um, struggle. And even if it was present in, in Pedro Castillo's movement, um, it's being used as a, as a positive force. Uh, I, That's I do exactly see right, because, because Nietzsche's intention in my reading, okay, like let's say purely from his, let's say just mm -hmm. what's Nietzsche's intention? Well, it would be the successful pacification of, of, of the working class so that their desires for new forms of leisure and enjoyment do not do not even come up mm -hmm. that's very pernicious and yeah. if you then at that point don't see him as an enemy i don't know what to tell you i don't know what to tell you <laughs> and 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 moreover um i completely agree with this comrade you just mentioned because that's what i think is is valid like it's valid for like class antagonisms to be the site of resentments. Like part of the, the paradox of resentment, I think, is that a lot of folks that champion it end up saying, no, 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 it's not valid to be resentful. Don't be yeah. resentful. So I mean, there's a lot there, but uh, we could do a whole podcast on this. Maybe we yeah, should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right. Uh, the, what I'm seeing is more so of a petty bourgeois form of resentment coming from the Western Marxists, who, although they criticize everything, have been the most impotent in actually carrying forth a revolution, even though their tradition, and specifically the way that they read Marx, tells them that they should have been the first one. And so on the basis of seeing that it was actually the global South, they treat it as a sort of sour grapes affairs. It's not real socialism. You're not actually bringing humanity forward in, uh, in a, to a mode of life that's radically more free and, and democratic. Um, it's actually just totalitarian, authoritarian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not to say that there aren't elements of that and, and contradictions, but I think it's, it's clear um, if we study all of the socialist societies of, of the past, with the exception perhaps of Pol Pot, which I don't consider anywhere near to uh, socialism, um, it's radically more free for working people, radically more free, radically more humanizing. You're, you're saying, for example, for example, for example, the socialism of Cuba or, for example, the communism, say, of contemporary China, for example. Right, right. Just, uh, I, I mean, I've been able to talk to scholars that have gone to China in the last uh, five or so years. It's almost a new world. It's like if you're living in 2030, not just in terms of the technological developments, but in terms of the freedom that you have as a as a Marxist thinker and um, the general standard of, of, of living, what that gives you access to do in terms of uh, leisure time uh, and what you can do with that leisure time, creative enterprises, etc. So, um, I mean, I think I think this is this is another point which is very um, needs 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 further discussion. I mean, I think. And we're not going to solve this here, but I mean, you've, you've raised a very interesting point, which I think on the one hand, if we tether or, or if we anchor a conception of socialism in the Western countries, say in the United States, to to the to the claim that um, communism in China, Cuba and other locations are not um, instantiations or versions that we must imitate but that are valid or that offer something. They're not completely negative lessons. Of course, of course, there are riddled with contradictions and problems and so on. And even moreover, um, class struggle should occur within those regions. Mm -hmm. It's not as if it's a completed 
scenario. Uh, but I mean, I think what you're saying is is a great challenge to the Western left because, in a sense, part of the reason why the Western left is interested in a conception of revolution that tends to be spontaneous, um, especially in this day and age, you know, where we don't have a party apparatus. Well, we have no anchors, right? So Western Marxism has no anchors. It's no surprise if you have no anchors that you would turn to the Messianic and to, uh, well, eventually what Lukács would say is you would turn to kind of irrationalist uh, yeah. frameworks of, of thinking. I mean, I don't want to go that far, although I think that there are elements of that happening already. Mm -hmm. So you've raised a very interesting challenge. Um, how do we as communists in the West relate to the real existence of socialist states and powers without fetishizing them, without mm -hmm. actually like harmfully fetishizing? And I know you're not advocating that. So could you speak to that question of that delicate, delicate sort of critical thing? Because immediately they're going to say, well, oh God, Carlos must be a propagandist for the Chinese Communist Party or something like that. God, That's I wish I could say. use the money. I could use the money. I wish. Um, the she uh, paychecks haven't came in. No, uh, that would just be another form of the purity fetish. If you have to make these socialist countries pure um, in order to support them, right, it would just be the inverse of the ones that condemn them. So, of course not. There's contradictions. Uh, there's internal debates. And I think that if we uh, are, are, are going to criticize, part of what we have to do is be cognizant of the internal debates, because I don't think anyone's going to know more about China than uh, the people that are engaging actively in the debates as to how to best advance the socialist process. Um, there's also a strand of people that have misunderstood what I'm doing with the concept of the purity fetish as a, and, and have taken it to that other extreme, which I would consider also a purity fetish. This is why it's a problem of outlook, not just of, of a series of conclusions. The purity fetish doesn't mean that you don't critique uh, certain things. On the contrary, I think it, it, the analysis of the purity fetish gives us some of the best tools for critiquing in a dialectical manner so that critique doesn't turn into condemnation. So that I can, for instance, say that uh, some of the foreign policy that China embarked in during the period of the Cultural Revolution was uh, not very good. Um, while the Soviets were funding progressive anti-colonial projects, they were aligning themselves with like Pinochet. Um, I can say, for instance, that I think that uh, uh, the Soviet Union, had it been around, would have been today much more active uh, in preventing the genocide of the Palestinian people than China is. That doesn't mean that they aren't doing positive things to, to stop and it's showing solidarity with the Palestinians, but those are genuine critiques. Um, the Soviet Union would have been a hell of a lot more proactive in helping Cuba so that you know my country isn't uh, in the horrendous conditions in which it is, is because of the the blockade it would have been much more active than china those are genuine critiques i hear you i think i think i hear you yeah i mean i think i think there is limits that i'm not willing to go where some go where they'll say they'll participate in kind of um intra-imperial rivalries and oh. i'm not saying you do this but i think one danger would be that the block of existing communist and socialist states could be supported in imperial rivalries with Western imperial powers. It's at that point where I back off or even to suggest that Russia might elevate to something that would be in alignment with North Korea and China. And so on this, like this axis thing in that, in that sense, I uh, uh, would not follow that. However, I would, cautiously agree with you regarding this point that um there are like extant and real models at a state level that when we create a party need to be seriously considered and not completely discarded and so on i, mean, I think during the cold war a lot of like say the althusserian marxist impetus was this kind of um neither neither the west nor right. the soviet or you know that's a pure purely um Obviously, in Trotskyism, you have this too, a pure rejection of the Soviet Union. And I think on the left, most of what we have is a pure rejection of, say, China. And um, you guys take a much more middle ground. I think there's people within Mid Mid Midwestern Marx that have different levels of support. Is that fair to say, Carlos? So you're not uniform well, on this issue. Yeah, we all support China. Um, 
no we, yes we, we we premise that support on on an understanding that there's still contradictions and, and and some things that that we're critical of but in in many ways um if i could be so bold i, I think in terms of geopolitics they're a great hope for humanity um what they're doing and, and allowing countries of the global south to develop through um you know win-win relationships with them and providing them an alternative to having to turn to the IMF and the World Bank. I think that's very uh, positive. And um, insofar as there's this very heterogeneous, ideologically diverse, even contradictory block that's arising as as an alternative to, uh, you know, the G7 and uh, U.S. imperialism with its uh, junior proxies in, in Europe, I think there is a progressive kernel there in terms of geopolitics or moving the class struggle forward. And the way that I've thought about it is somewhat akin to um, how uh, the Maoist, not Maoist, but the, the tradition of Mao's thought has understood uh, certain forms of national liberation struggles as occurring in, in two stages. When you're in imperialized uh, circumstances, the first stage of the struggle is usually one that uh, unites the whole of the people for a common interest, which includes the bourgeoisie. And if that struggle is successful against imperialism, the struggle becomes more acutely a struggle of the workers, or uh, if you know we're speaking at that time, the peasantry and um, the owning classes. So I, I think that what's going on with something like BRICS is an ad a progressive advancement of history um, with a group of heterogeneous and perhaps contradictory ideological positions within that uh, block. Uh, it's nothing like the the CAMCOM, the, the, the Soviet uh, block that existed in the previous century, but in some ways it's much more powerful. And even in the countries where we don't have socialist economies and communist parties in power, I think that an anti-imperialist victory for them is going to create more fertile conditions for class struggles at home. In the same way that the Leninist tradition holds that the struggle for democratic rights of uh, oppressed and marginalized groups within bourgeois states, it doesn't like, uh, it's not just neutral to the class struggle, it makes the class struggle more acute. The struggle in these countries, which is basically the global south, the global majority against imperialism, uh, is going to make in the countries that are not socialist, those struggles more acute. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. There's the whole like Belt and Road and the kind of notion that China is engaging in soft economic expansion. You can call that imperialist expansion. There is um, a kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of like a new Cold War brewing uh, with China. So, that, you know, it's very important that we that we that we remain very attentive to all of these dynamics and um I'd like to talk with you further as they, because I'm, I'm no Chinese uh, expert, but this is certainly an area that that we should um, that we should discuss. And I feel like we're just, um, you know, you know, just getting to know one another. And it's been a great first exchange. Um, I guess my my sort of uh, to wrap our convo for now. Final question, Carlos. Um, I want to ask you about the question of. Um, leadership on the left in america and how you understand like this category of pmc um which it's not the greatest class <laughs> category some some have argued well you invoke it it's not exactly a marxist category of class analysis i think that may be true um but it does point to something very um a very evident um it's merely in an intuitive level which is why the the concept has a certain pull and popularity um and how do you how do you assess the pmc thesis um how might you uh navigate the problems of the pmc like for example have you in your analysis we talked about the 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 category of petty bourgeois are they synonymous um because one of the things that is interesting is also the sense of um and i get this a lot from the sociologist pierre bourdieu in his um analysis of what triggered the uprising of may 68 he wrote a book called homo academicus and you know what it was in a sense you could call it kind of like a bloated pmc where the promises of the society 
of the kind of social contract of social mobility in France of a young generation that were that was overeducated uh, became unfulfillable for a large stratum of that population. And so for me, the PMC is already an internally contradictory class, especially after 2008, precisely because we have been experiencing that same phenomenon, the rise of austerity, the collapse of social mobility, um, the return to class. Yet, because some social mobility still exists, you still have what you might call a vanguard PMC, right? Who are from working class backgrounds, exist in professional jobs, maybe on the lower rung of them, right? And they are the most receptive to our ideas. Mm -hmm. So you see my point. There's a certain way you can say, oh, well, the whole PMC like is is guilty. And that becomes almost like a kind of resentiment politics, like right? Like, so do you see it that way? You know what I'm saying? Like maybe, yeah, PMC is real, it's dangerous. Um, but you know, there's also outliers, right? So the question then is how do you organize the disenchanted PMC perhaps is one way to put it. Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. If I can say something real quick about China, um, it's, it's, it's such a central issue that in terms of the, the, the purity fetish, I, I dedicated, um, it's the only thing that I do that. So I dedicated a whole chapter um around it so i, I would love to uh, discuss that further at, at some other point but um i don't think it's dangerous i don't think that the, the pmc it's dangerous i think what's dangerous is having that form of um middle class i guess uh, be the center of socialist organizations that has always been a danger that marxists uh, well all the way back to to marx and the first international have warned against um we do need intellectuals and, and uh, intellectual, traditional intellectuals that come from, from the academy. Uh, but the condition of their entrance is that they submit themselves to uh, the interests of, of the proletariat. And what's happened, I think, since the 70s, it's not disconnected from uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom that we spoke about, uh, is that at the institutional level, a lot of the previous organs of working class power have been destroyed and previous organs of the left that were rooted in the working class have been uh, middle classified or bourgeoisified in the sense of uh, being more and more rooted in this professional managerial class, or I think perhaps a better term uh, is professional managerial stratum of the um, working class at large, uh, people that work for salaries and not necessarily wages. Um, this, uh, this is a very interesting question. You had asked me earlier, um, one of the central reasons why I, I think socialism hasn't worked in the U.S. And I think it's very much connected to to this question. I have a, a short section in the book on the on the PMC, and in, in many ways, I I think uh, institutionally it is the foundation of the ideological crisis within the left, the purity fetish. Um, what we have in the 20th century, for a variety of reasons, for uh, the need to challenge the living standard of, of the Soviets for uh, the actual advancements of, of working class unions, which were led by communists, and because of the fact that we were an imperialist superpower that had the, you know, the, the ability to give crumbs to the working class. Because of a mixture of all those factors, we end up developing a working class, a significant part of the working class that has a middle class standard of living. Um, if you go back to Engels and Marx, sometimes they float around the word of that part of the, the homologist part uh, uh, to that in, in Britain being uh, a bourgeoisified working class. So we, we, we think that in that golden age of America in the 20th century, specifically in the white proletariat, there was a process of bourgeoisification um, that gave them uh, a certain sense of security um, a, a, the capacity to accumulate, to own a home, to have one or two automobiles, and to have a decent life, the sort of life that you don't want to put at risk um, in, in fighting for socialism, right? There's that uh, argument that um, Vivek Shiver uses that it's not so much that we have been convinced by the ideas, but that we renunciate ourselves because we know what can happen if we fight for 
an alternative world that might be better. Um, but we have this period of bourgeoisification in our working class that uh, gets a large chunk of the American proletariat and just, it doesn't remove absolutely their power to be revolutionary, but it creates an incredible uh, fetter for it. Engels had already said, as soon as the proletariat owns a house, forget about it. Um, it's going to be very hard to, to fight uh, for socialism. And what we've had uh, since the development of neoliberalism, since this process of uh, exporting all productive capital, financializing the capital that's um, that, that does end up staying here at home, is a process of re-proletarianization. Um, which is the, the concept that one of our co-directors, Noah Krashevik, has, has developed. The same parts of the working class that had bourgeoisified uh, in the middle of the last century, now their kids are being re-proletarianized. And, you know, we all know the statistics. This is the, we have the, the first, like, two generations that, for the first time in history, American history, are going to have lives worse than their parents, more precarious. Mm -hmm. Any idea about owning a house is just... Uh, it's lunacy. I mean, I talk to my students about this and they're not thinking about owning a house ever. Like they don't see it possible. I, I talked to one student yesterday whose mom just bought a house. She's 62. It's the first time she's ever owned mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. um, so what ends up happening, I think, is that you have that, um, that pulling down into the proletariat of this previously bourgeoisified segment of society. It makes them a lot more open to socialist ideas. They join mm -hmm. the socialist organizations, the DSA, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in terms of social consciousness, it's still very middle class. The concerns in many ways mm -hmm. are, are middle class concerns. And so you have certain situations like with, with Noah, he's a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he says it all the time. They, they ask him in his club, why don't you bring your co-workers? You say you have convinced all of these you know, poor mm -hmm. Uh, libertarian co-workers about communism why don't you bring them in and it's very clear because the people he's brought in they don't want to be there they don't want to touch a, a leftist a middle-class leftist with a 10-foot pole the concerns are just different the the forms of sociality are, are very middle class right. Right. I mean, education class people, right. yeah yeah education working class people love to bust balls <laughs> and, sure. and say the things that they're, they're afraid they're afraid they're, they're going to say the wrong thing they're afraid they're going to get uh, called out exactly yeah, I mean, this is kind of the Oliver Anthony, we could call this the Oliver Anthony symptom, right? Oh, yeah. Um, right? Because, we got a lot of shit for that, yeah. No, I mean, I was, I was watching it all unfold, and one of my comrades, um, uh, Julie, went on and talked to Eddie at Midwestern Marks about it, and um, mm. when that whole thing was going down, it's like, um, you know, it brought out, like, class... Because America is so structurally averse to thinking class politics, when it actually right. happens, you get these little moments of it. People lose lose their bearings and they lose their mind. And this is a reason, Carlos, why we need a party. Because yeah. a party is an organ of moderation, of stability. And um, like there's this great, incredible, I, I recommend this book to everybody. It's a It's a memoir of a French intellectual a former student of Michel Foucault, um, uh, who happens to be homosexual and who happens to be a fairly prominent French writer of um, theory and philosophy, Didier Erbon, and his book uh, about returning to Rems, which is his hometown, working class town. And he talks about how when he was a boy, all these working class men, if you compare their general racism he says like it was all put under control by the party because the communist mm -hmm. party was for universalism and egalitarian anti-racism no question almost like as a law so you that you see the point it allowed people to be loose and free and say what they want and so on because they all had a fidelity to the party right what happened after the party's dead you get the front national what does the front national do they manipulate the racism they exaggerate it <laughs> we know why they do that the same thing that the uh you know uh, obama wing of the democrats do mm -hmm. they want that racism there because it stands in for something else right 
So we need a party, bro. Like this is this this is the answer. I mean, there has to be an organ that will allow for the like not to be too fancy, but like the um, antagonisms of our everyday life to uh, have an accepting embrace for people to to feel like they can be themselves, mm -hmm. right? If you if you have a working class culture, you're trying to build the working class culture. I mean, I don't know how you I don't know how to do that otherwise. And I know you agree. So I'm just sort of saying that for the audience, I guess. A hundred percent. I mean, we have to understand that, especially uh, considering how the material conditions are. And the last chapter is, is an analysis. First, of, I try to demonstrate um, how what has been called in our tradition objectively revolutionary conditions is present in the U.S. and that the crisis is one of the subjective factor. And that's why, you know, I repeat over and over that the purity fetish not only prevents us from understanding the world correctly, but from actually changing it. It's not without reason that we haven't done anything. Um, but um, we absolutely do need a party because what we find is that people have these common sense, spontaneous, organic worldviews that are informed by the culture around them. And they're starting to dissent. And that dissent is taking a plurality of, of various different forms that are incoherent. And we can't shy away from that incoherence because it's not purely aligned with our worldview. The job of the communist can be reduced to this, to convince, to convince, to win the minds and hearts of people. And that means people who don't already agree with you. If not, we're just singing to the choir. It means going out there whether it's the, the, the MAGA part of the working class or the Biden part of the working class or the previous Bernie part of the, the working class that's perhaps on certain social issues more advanced, um, it's realizing that in different forms, these people are dissenting. Some people see MAGA as the solution, some don't, um, but they're still dissenting. And it's our job to take those various forms of incoherent forms of dissent and give them coherence. We can try to do that through the, the, the pathways that, that we're doing it, building these sorts of think tanks that influence people that are already online. But ultimately, without a party, uh, we're no. And if you have you know, existing parties that might perhaps become those, those vehicles, be rooted in this middle class consciousness that uh, is anathema to this sort of working class culture, uh, it's going to be very hard to, to build that. We just had Professor... Uh, Danny Shaw from from New York, someone who's developed as a militant in that New York, more cosmopolitan, more sometimes middle class slash uh, lumpen working class culture. But in terms of the meetings, the people running them, very middle class in terms of their sociality. He came out to the Midwest and he was amazed by the potential of working class people here, regardless of whether they were Trumpers or not. He was amazed by that potential. But he told me, he told us, uh, uh, he was with another comrade, he told us that if any of the people that we hung out with spoke in those ways in New York, they'd be canceled. They wouldn't be allowed to join a party or they, they wouldn't be. Because so they say certain words that they, they're not saying it out of malice, but they're just busting balls. And, and, and that's something that's so central to working class culture. You have a few drinks, you bust uh, some balls, you say some politically incorrect things and you get over it. At the end of the day, it's not uh, often said out of malice, especially not for younger people. Now you get to their grandparents, <laughs> that might be a different story. Um, mm -hmm. But for younger folks, and, and, and that's the situation it, it, that Noah faced. Why don't you bring your coworkers? Well, because everything that I've done to help them convince them about communism, when I take them to a communist party and they see that, they're going to be like, I don't want that. That's what the mm -hmm. ruling class has told me communists are. I do not want that. Oh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't help that the Communist Party is so in bed with the Democrats. And I mean, uh, Angela Davis has done incredible work, but it's like, it's like, you know, it matters symbolically, you know, who you align yourself with if you're a major intellectual. And when I look out at the state of the existing left organizationally, I am, I am, I am extremely disappointed um, with Dr. West, with, Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders is done. I mean, forget Bernie Sanders, man. I'm, it's you know what I'm saying. Like we are in a we are in a completely unpredictable situation where anything is possible organizationally. So for that, we should be hopeful because right. we we have nothing. There's hardly any barriers to actually doing. The, the whole world is open. 
not that many impediments. Maybe that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And the older generation, there's not many people that are kind of leading the way in this, at least in this way, might have done great research, written great books, but organizationally, we have a poverty of existing mm -hmm. models that we can pull from. And I, I'm, 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 we touched on a lot of the, the purity fetish book, but I want to say like in closing, um, in part because I got to go to uh, my son's uh, performing in a um, Black History Month uh, performance. Uh, I have to yes. go to that. Um, can you tell us anything that I may have missed that you wanted to mention regarding the book and maybe anything about what y'all are doing at Midwestern Marks? Again, Carlos, I want this to be the beginning of many future yeah, conversations yeah. we have. Well, um, I just want to reiterate, thank you so much for, for having me on, um, I'm blowing through how to read like a parasite. And I, I absolutely love it. I mentioned that I've been recommending it to, to people and hopefully we can have you back on sometime soon to talk about not just the, the Nietzsche book, but uh, the other essay that, that, that you shared with me about pragmatism and, and Marxism and U.S. socialism, um, which was another one of the central, I, I think, uh, areas where the left falls is it's so deeply ingrained in a national nihilism. Uh, and uh, again, it's a poverty of dialectical thinking. Our form of socialism is not gonna be a copy of the Chinese. It's not gonna be a copy of the socialists. It's going to have the characteristics of our struggles and our people and the elements of our culture that are rational enough to be incorporated within socialism because that's how the, universals, the universal content of socialism functions. It's always given a particular form uh, that, uh, um, that is shaped by the people that waged and won that struggle. And um, so hawking back to, to history, to the progressive forces is, is essential. Um, when we create a future, that's not just what we're doing. We're not just creating, we're recreating a past. We're providing a, a rereading of, of history. And our history of struggles has been a forgotten, a maligned, a distorted, a domesticated history. And Part of what's central to our project, to the Journal of American Social Studies, which is where we do it in a scholarly fashion, is recapturing this positive history so that it can help us uh, give our movements historical legs so that we're not just thinking what we're doing is, is coming out of nowhere, but so that we see ourselves in a legacy of people who have fought, died, lost job opportunities, been oppressed, uh, you know, beaten, uh, incarcerated for fighting for the ideas that we're fighting for today. And we can't let their struggles die in vain. We have to redeem their struggles by continuing to fight and continuing to push forward. So uh, I, I think our era is one that's pregnant with revolutionary potential, but we have a crisis of outlook. We have a crisis of organization, which is, I think uh, it's properly described as a, a crisis in the subjective factor. I think more and more people are starting to agree with that. A lot more than you know when we got the institute started four years ago. So um, we'll see. We have to be creative. The party of a new type was a party of a new type. It was a, a creative mm -hmm. en endeavor. Perhaps we need a party of a new new type or or something else. But whatever helps us advance the class struggle in this much needed time has to be considered and and tested and and, and see if it works. Carlos Guido, thank you so much, comrade, for coming on. Bro, we'll stay in touch and brilliant, inspiring words. Um, this is, we've written a very compelling book and I want folks to check it out. Check out Midwestern Marks. I'm sure you all have heard of it. Um, yeah, to be continued. Thanks everybody Thank for so listening. Much, Thank you.